And howdy folks, I'm Anthony Dream Johnson, your favorite president of the Manosphere. Here today with a special interview for 21 Live with uh, Bruce Wayne's third cousin, Coach Corey Wayne, YouTube's top coach. Uh, Corey, welcome to the show, man. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, man. It's been good meeting you. We met uh, about a week ago now. Yep. And I got to be interviewed by you at Wayne Towers, as I call them, downtown Orlando. <laughs> that was a good time, man. Thanks, man. Um, went for like three hours, so I was, you know, I, was a, I was impressed. Yeah, my neck was pretty jacked up because I'd spent about three hours before interviewing uh, Dr. Dominic Deanna, and I was yeah. sitting there the whole time like this looking at him. and So I was about six hours straight, wow. and when he worked on me the next day, my neck was all yep. jacked up and cranked over. Cool. So we got a lot of good footage, though. So for those of you who don't know Coach Corey Wayne, he's a big YouTuber, uh, up and coming, and he's getting, for an individual YouTuber, he's huge. He's about to break 400,000 subscribers, I think, any day now. He's big on Instagram, but mostly on YouTube is where you'll find him. And I've been following his content for years, uh, both personally a little bit, and then my friends that keep recommending his videos to me. A lot of fans, too, have been requesting him as a speaker at the 21 convention. We'll see if that happens. He's also an author, self-published, How to Be a 3% Man. This is his first book, second edition. And you have another book as well, Mastering Yourself. Yep, Mastering Yourself came out in 2018. It's more of a um, f figuring out your purpose in life, quality okay. of life things, like going to health. Yeah. I go through my whole life story. There's a lot of business stuff in there, marketing stuff, because these are all things that I get into with with my clients. And by yeah. having all that stuff down in book format, yeah, you know, that way they can read it and learn that stuff ahead of time, and then we can be more efficient in the phone well, sessions. Let's back up a second here. So, <clears throat> you've been on YouTube since 2012, 11. I think it was 2011. I did my first video, and okay. I've been blogging for several years before that, yeah. writing and on your website, understandingrelationships.com. Yep. Yeah. So, but you weren't always doing this, obviously. obviously. You know, 2011, you started YouTube, blogging a bit before that. Before all that, you were in real estate. And even yeah. before that, you've been a lifelong entrepreneur. Yeah, well, my parents were entrepreneurs. They were in the coin laundry business. And, okay. you know, my dad, even to this day, still has two coin laundries that do very yeah. well. He started out doing, like when I was a kid in middle school, we were doing a lot of hotel accounts. We were doing um, hmm. sheets and towels from like, you know, we had two big hotels. And, and this is all in Florida you grew up in? Yep. Yeah. yeah. South Florida, Pompano Beach area, Fort nice. Lauderdale area. And, I'm uh, a West Coast guy myself. Fort Myers, <laughs> Fort Misery, they call it. Yeah. Fort Misery. <laughs> Cape, Cape Coma. <laughs> one of my high school buddies was, was from there and he actually lived with, you know, our senior year with one of my other friends hmm. that I, I went to high school with because obviously he liked it over in Pompano, Fort Lauderdale a lot better. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, my background is I'm a, I'm a builder. I'm an engineer. I went to school for construction management, and so wow. I have an engineering background. And I used to work in the construction industry. I worked for three different companies before I started my own. And the last one was a company called Syntex Rooney. And hmm. in the '90s, they were part of Syntex Construction Group, okay. which at the time they were the largest builder <clears throat> in the world. And uh, we worked at the Coronado uh, Resort at Disney World, which is like I think it's 2,000 rooms, 300,000 square foot convention yeah, I've been center. There, yeah, it's huge. Pretty amazing project if you're ever at Disney. It's a beautiful place to stay. It's got a replica of a Mayan pyramid with waterfalls going down the stairs and steam yeah. and smoke and stuff coming off. It's, I think I stayed there as a kid. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty cool place. Nice. So I did that, and then I, you know, my I started on that path <clears throat> when I was 18 because I my whole goal was I just wanted yeah. to buy, fix, and sell single family homes for a profit. So to be clear here, you've been an entrepreneur your entire adult life. Yep. Nice. I could say the same as well, and uh, that's that's unusual. That's rare. So that was a path. I didn't start my first company till 96. You were early 20s? Yeah, so yeah, I would have yeah. been uh, 26 years old at the time. Close enough. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I figured at the time I had enough experience in the business and I was, you know, I was tired. I wanted to get out of the corporate world. Yeah. And uh, they were getting ready to ship me off to another job anyways because most of the stuff I was in charge of was mm -hmm. mostly done and coordinated. And I really didn't want to move anywhere, mm. and it just, you know, I had that internal itch inside that was telling me that it's time to move on and do mm. what I, the whole reason why I got into construction management in the industry is learn how to build, because mm. then when I start flipping houses, I can do a great job fixing them up, that kind of thing. Well, so. it sounds like you went from building houses to building relationships. That... Well, it, it really started out as a hobby to help myself when yeah. I was in, you know, I think the first quote that I memorized when I was in sixth grade. Wow. And I can even, I remember it to this day, one of my, my buddies <clears throat> that I was in sixth grade with, he had a quote in the back of his folder and it said, there is a point at which you can only see so far. And when you reach that point, you can see further, live one day at a time and make it a masterpiece. Okay. And so I, 
that kind of started a lifelong fascination with self-help, personal growth, you know, studying biographies of famous, successful people. Yeah, before we went live, you were telling me that you were into, you know, were listening to Tony Robbins, his personal power tapes and things like that, interviews back in like the early 90s. Yeah, yeah. well, late 80s, early 90s. It's wow. like you couldn't turn on a TV without seeing yeah. a Tony Robbins commercial and the Floby and some <clears throat> of those other things that, you know, that was like a vacuum cleaner attachment that you just kind of vacuum the hair and the, the suction of the vacuum would cause these blades to spin. So when your mm -hmm. hair got sucked in, into the thing, it would chop it off and make it the right length. Then Tony Robbins oh. was, <laughs> was on. And I remember I was up late one night and I was, I think, in my fifth year of college. Mm. I was thinking, man, I, all my buddies were graduating and coming mm -hmm. home, and here I, I still had at least another two years to go of school because I wow. kept dropping classes that were hard. And, and uh, it wasn't until I went through Tony Robbins' work that I realized how I was mentally sabotaging myself because mm -hmm. I was afraid to find out if I was smart enough to pass calculus yeah. and some of the physics and some of the other classes that I had to take. And you ended up getting a degree in engineering. Yeah, well, I, construction yeah. management was in the, the okay. uh, College of Engineering and Design, so I had to have a lot of engineering classes. To get, yeah, yeah. You know, if you're building a skyscraper, you've got to understand how yeah. um, moment and inertia and you know the strength of concrete and the tensile strength of rebar. And what I've heard how hard this stuff is. Yeah, because you've got to figure yeah. this stuff out, because if your yeah. columns aren't big enough, the building will collapse. One of our speakers, as I mentioned, is a civil architect, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Socrates, so mm -hmm. I hear a lot about this. I know a couple of engineers too, you know, guys my age I went to school with and stuff, so tough stuff, man. Yeah, so that, you know, I just started setting self up because I wanted to be successful. I went to my parents, the best thing that they ever did for me was they sent me to a Catholic high school, Cardinal wow. Gibbons High School in Fort Lauderdale. And, wow. You know, I'm just a blue collar, middle class type, type blue of collar, guy. Blue collar, blue hat, nice yeah, hat. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so hey, I'm going to school with all these rich kids that are driving Porsches and stuff mm. to school and, you know, I'm driving a 10 year old Toyota and hanging out with these guys and what what struck me was that they're just regular you know i didn't feel inferior mm. when i would hang out with them or their parents i and I, re I recognize that they're just regular people yeah there had to be something different they were doing that enabled them to be way more financially successful than the average person and so i just started studying self-help more especially to figure out what was why was it i kept dropping all these classes and i couldn't like get over the hump yeah and after going through Tony Robbins' personal power tapes, what I realized that I was so afraid of failing and that my, because my mother's way of trying to motivate me was, you know, you're never going to amount to anything. You're going to turn out just like your Aunt Marianne because, you know, she didn't get Jesus. along with her sisters. And, and so as a, you know. Negativity, basically. Yeah. yeah negative, that yeah. was her way of trying to motivate me. And I, hmm. in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, what if she's right? Oh then I don't get my God. degree and all this time I spent in college is an absolute so waste. So it's safe to say this was not productive for you being successful in this kind of parenting. Well, you could say I'm it sure turned out okay because sure. part words, of the attitude because yeah. masculine energy grows through challenge. And yeah. part of it was like, fuck you, mom. I'm going <laughs> to prove you yeah. right. I'm going to prove you wrong. And mm. and I was determined to figure it out, you know, because you're, mm. you know, I was like 22 at the time. And so I'm like, I'm literally having the thoughts of myself that, I'm going to be a fucking loser the rest of my life and never, never do what I want to do mm. and have to settle for mediocrity or I'm going to find a way and succeed. And what clicked when I was going through Tony's stuff was the, my fear of failure and cause people do more to avoid pain than they do to gain pleasure. And so what yeah. I was doing was that when <clears> it came time to sit down and do calculus homework or physics or any of the other classes I was dropping. I would. I didn't want to do it. It didn't feel good because in the back of my mind, I'm scared. I'm not smart enough, hmm. and so I would just kept putting it off and putting it off. And you know, two and a half weeks in the new semester, you've got your first test, hmm. and so I'm like, all right, now I gotta, I gotta stay home and cram this weekend. And when you, you're two and a half weeks behind in calculus and you try to cram in a day, yeah. it's not gonna work. I'd go in there and I'd fail the first test because I wouldn't. I'd see these problems. I wouldn't recognize any of it and didn't understand it. And what I, what really clicked with me and I recognized what I was doing, I was sabotaging my own success. I kept putting things off and then it would just build up to this big mountain. <clears throat> then I would try to cram and it would, it just wouldn't work. Yeah. And then, so I didn't up dropping a, a test or two. And, you know, back then usually the professors would allow you to drop your worst test score. And yeah, so I, I and that would be the excuse. So I'd be coming up to the drop date where you can drop it and not get an F, just a, a withdrawal basically. Yep. yep. And I would just withdraw from the class and then figure out I'll take it next semester. And so I would take other classes that I enjoyed and I could pass no problem. But at the end of the day, if I still didn't pass calculus, I didn't get my degree. 
yeah. wouldn't be able to get my general contractor's license. I wouldn't be able to have the life I wanted. So I, I learned to kind of reverse the psychology on myself instead of going, oh, wow, Friends is on tonight. I'll watch that. And then this weekend I'll study or Seinfeld is so on. So let's just pause here. So you're 50, 51? Yeah. 50. Just 50. turned 50. Okay, nice. Yeah. Congrats. Yeah. Halfway to 100. Yeah, thanks, man. Yeah. yeah. 50 is the new A third 30. of the way to 150. Yeah, exactly. Dude, 50 is the new 30 for men. I think you're fine. Yeah. My goal um, ultimately is to live, I want, I'd like to live to be 150, just to, okay. can you imagine how much change you'd be able to see? Yeah, you know, a lot. What would happen? In Who that? knows, man, with modern tech and if, yeah. if civilization doesn't fall apart, I think it's possible for sure. Yeah. So, but it, it's just interesting because you're from such a different generation than me. I mean, you're 20 years ahead of me. I'm 31 myself. So it's hearing you, you know, watch Friends and the Tony Robbins tapes in the 80s. I was in the, you know, I was born in 88. So just hearing That's the year I graduated funny. high school. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, I think when you yeah, say beer sense, is good, yeah. sex is great, we're the class of 88. Yeah. Yeah, you saw the whole. No, so let's. There's a lot I want to get into with you with the limited time we have. We got about another hour to go. Um, before we get into some political things, I want to get into Trump stuff and other, other issues. Tell me about the book How to Be a 3% Man. What is a 3% Man? Why is that important? So. Why should I care? The reason I. Well, the, the <clears throat> book covers date. It, pick up dating and a relationship it's like transitioning through all three phases because it's a different skill set yeah. for each you know if you're just picking up girls and taking them home and banging them it's you really only need to know the basic seduction stuff yeah but if you meet a girl you actually want to date and enjoy hanging out with and yeah. listening to yep. you know if you don't get that transition right you're gonna fumble the football and she's gonna friend zone you or blow you off or say i don't feel any chemistry. or some other disaster no disaster yeah. will happen yeah so I, I wrote the book because it's basically based on my life story because I had to figure all this stuff out. I certainly didn't learn anything from my parents hmm. as far as relationship goes because my mother was a psychotic schizophrenic. I mean, she literally flipped out and had a nervous breakdown when I was, I was 19. I was in college hmm. and she was never the same again. And my parents never hugged us. They never said, I love you. <clears throat> They argued a lot. My dad just sat in front of the TV and kind of drank beer and spaced out and zoned out. And so like when it mm. came to the dating world, it's like I had no skills. I didn't know what yeah. to do. And, and you I, didn't feel that you were in a culture that enabled you to otherwise learn about women and relationships. Is that about right? I just, well, the, you just, the idea was that there's something wrong with you if you can't get a date mm. and you're just a broken human being and Why can't you're just be fucked. like friends, man? Just friends. You know, everybody's just friends and it all works out, dude. Yeah, 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 be friends first. Yeah, friends, exactly, friends first. There you go, yeah. <laughs> so I, I knew that something was wrong, and I got I got married yeah. in the mid-'90s to a girl who was a... My wife was awesome. She was a great wife, came from a really good family, had a good relationship with her parents and her dad. Mm. She, she was really into me. Any kids? Uh, no, we didn't have kids. We were only married a year. Mm. But it's like I, lo I really loved her and I cared about her, but I wasn't in love. I didn't feel like a spiritual connection. I didn't feel like the universe had destined us to be together i should have mm. dated her for a few years and then when i moved to orlando you know mm. we should have split up but mm. i didn't know any better i mean yeah. you know where I'm, I'm gonna get information from my parents or my grandparents or you know there's just nothing but dysfunctional relationships in, in my mm. family from my perception mm. and guys that i knew that were really good with women they just knew what to do and they couldn't exp they would just say things like just be a dick yeah. and, you know <laughs> But that's, that's kind of not helpful, you know? <laughs> well, it's better you, than being a nice guy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, but yeah, it's pretty short-sighted. At the end of the day, that's that's not going to get you very far, just just being a, being a dick about yeah, it. Yeah. So I knew there were things I needed to learn, and I always believed that we're spiritual beings having a human experience, and there are no accidents in life. I believe, like we were talking about the other day, I believe in reincarnation. Yeah, I find that I surprising. I wasn't aware of it. in the journey of the soul. I believe the soul is not gender-specific. I believe in one life you might be a man, the next life you might be a woman. Mm. and race and all that other stuff it's it's kind of irrelevant it's really just the spiritual fleshy avatar if you will that our spirits inhabit mm. as we're going through life and it's like when you meet somebody and you feel like you've known them forever whether it's a guy you become friends with mm. a customer or a woman that you date mm. you know that is the universe's way the divine's way of kind of it's like you recognize each other yeah. Like all my my closest friends, girls that I've dated that were really good, high quality relationships, and some of the women that I've been friends, lifelong friends with, like my assistant who I've known for like twenty five years. Now, do you identify with any organized religion today? Buddhism? No, I was like raised that? Catholic. I studied okay. Catholicism. I studied Islam. Mm -hmm. I studied um, 
read the Quran, um, the Bhagavad Gita, the um, what's the one that Madonna's that is into? You know what I'm talking about? Which the one? the um, the Jewish faith, the Kabbalah. I read okay. the Kabbalah, and I just I didn't I didn't resonate with that. You know, I would ask mm. you know because we went to Catholic high school, so there yeah. were priests and nuns teach us, and I would ask him about things. Okay, so what happens when a six month old baby dies? Oh. Does that baby go to hell or like? Well, we don't really know. It's like they just didn't have answers for things I wanted answers to. And you had a lot of questions, yeah. And I just didn't, I didn't jive uh, with you it. You sound it like just, a troublemaker, Corey. Yeah. Well, it just seemed like a lot of dogma to me. And, you mm. know, I'm a seeker. I wanted, I wanted an answer. You know, I was like mm. that kid was always like, but why? Yeah, but yeah, why? yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah, I'm not yeah. satisfied with, well, we don't know. We just trust it's part That's of God's plan. That's the best question. Why? It, yeah. Why is that? Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, huh. I set out to figure it out. And, and part of that was studying, you know, these, these traditional religious books. Yep. Yeah. And you get a little bit from each one. You start to see commonalities and then yeah. I would my, have my own experiences. And um, like I said, I, I wanted to have a spiritual connection with a woman where I felt like it was a soulmate type of thing. Mm. Um, but, you know, I don't believe that you're you so, have you're like so one book, soulmate. I believe you have multiple you can have multiple soulmates where, mm. like I said, when you meet them, you feel like you know them already. And you talk, and it's effortless. I should put this on my Tinder profile. You have might multiple. want to. <laughs> 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 All right. Let's, uh, one, of the, one of the biggest things you say, I think, on your everything you do, website, YouTube channel, everything, you say life, and correct me if I'm wrong, you say life is relationships. That's a, that's a big statement. That's a philosophic statement. Talk to me about that. Why isn't life I've, suffering? Why I isn't learned life... that from uh, one of my teachers, these, these gurus out in India, uh, Shriyama Bhagavan. Okay. Um, he was the first one that had said that. and Because you remember. have some competition. P people like Jordan Peterson say life is suffering, and people say life is maybe the pursuit of happiness. Like, there's a lot of competing ideas out there. That's why I wanted to bring it up, too. Yeah, so I look at life is relationships. I mean, everything is relationships with other human beings, whether it's a woman you're trying to date and have a relationship with, or mm. your friends, or your parents, or your customers. Mm. At the end of the day, it's all about influencing other people to help them give you what it is that you want, and also you helping them get what it is that they want. And mm. so, you know, the reason I chose understandingrelationships.com is because I... My goal when I started this was not just to do dating and relationship stuff. Yeah. Is that that was just going to be the first book in a series of books. Mm. But it took so long to figure out where the right spot was to... Because if you go to the average guy, I got a book that's going to help you understand women. Yeah. They're going to look at you like you're nuts and yeah. I, I, I don't have time for that. I, I got to go to the gym or I got to work. I got to this, I got to that. But as soon as the girl that they think is <clears> going to be the next wife their yeah. love of their life friend zones them or goes ah there's no chemistry there's no spark i just kind of think of you as a friend yeah or the wife serves them a divorce papers they're like where the hell was that guy's name in that book or I even things like that. dead bedroom and stuff like that what's that a uh, dead bedroom if you heard of that no i haven't heard dead of that. bedroom uh marriage or long-term relationship where the sex dies so the bedroom is dead you know guys you probably heard of clients like yeah well, so months and years without sex all of the guys that I talk to that are <clears throat> married or in long-term relationships, mm. I'd say probably 90, 95% of them are in counseling and therapy. Well, and the therapist is pleading with the wife or the girlfriend, oh, please have sex with God. your husband or your boyfriend. Oh. You gotta, you gotta put out basically. <laughs> and I actually have a book that says, it says first kill all the marriage counselors. <laughs> you might enjoy it. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, it has its place for communication, sure. but they just, they don't have the skill set. They don't understand attraction. They don't understand how to teach it. And I'll do yeah. one phone session with a guy mm. and it's just getting him to act masculine and be the leader again and start dating and courting his wife or his girlfriend properly. And I mean, the sex comes back like that, mm. whether it's a heterosexual couple or a gay couple or, you know, I coach a lot of lesbians as well because oh the, the le most of the lesbians I talk to tend to be more masculine and they like feminine women. Mm. They have the same exact problem that heterosexual guys have when their well. girlfriends don't want to sleep with them. So I basically just teach them to act like the guy would act. And I'll get an email after the phone session, like, we just had the best sex we've had in two years, and they hadn't had sex in a year, you know? Oh just because she started acting like the leader and the masculine yeah, one. Yeah. So every relationship, there's got to be a good, strong sexual polarity between That's masculine right. energy and feminine energy. When they're too much alike, it's, it's <laughs> like platonic. It's friendship. 
This is why we talked about feminism the other day in your interview you did with me, and I, I believe that feminism is like a philosophy of zero. They want to zero everything out. They want to zero out masculinity. They want to zero out femininity. And the result is everything's a depolarized, you know, flat line kind of mess. And it results in destroying relationships, dead bedrooms, all this dysfunctional crap that we fix. Yep. So we'll get into that later, maybe. Here's another question I have, because you, you've done a really good, uh, you know, I've, for years in the Manosphere operating as a conference organizer, a media publisher, you know, speeches and all that that we do. Early on, I was a guy who would actually inject some level of political discussion, even at a philosophic level. I was into Ron Paul, for example, and the founders, the founding fathers. Mm -hmm. And back in 2011, 2012, I started talking about that. And in the manosphere, this ticked a lot of people off because they tried to keep it like apolitical and no politics at all. But I fundamentally disagree with that. And it wasn't just that I liked these ideas. I saw them as important. Now, today we see the cancel culture and that has a big problem or a big uh, conflict with like free speech freedom of speech a, a right you know a right that you have yeah it's like the you what you have is you have collectivism <clears throat> wrestling with individualism yeah the collectivists want everybody to be the same they want everything to be fair that's why they don't like billionaires because the reality is most people most average human beings don't want a responsibility for their own lives they okay. want they want to be mommied and babied and there's so much propaganda there's so many people in the news and the media that believe in communism and collectivism yeah that it sounds good. It yeah. oh, I won't have to struggle. I mean, you probably remember during when um, Obama was running for his first term, there was this woman who was on TV and they were interviewing her, and, and she was saying, you know, I figured, uh, you know, he's gonna he's gonna pay my mortgage, he's gonna put gas in my car, oh my he's God. gonna help me out. So I figured I'll help him out, and that's why I voted for him. And wow. she literally believed that if she voted for Barack Obama, that all her problems are gonna be solved, and she's gonna yeah. get a nice steady paycheck. So he's like, hey, I'll just vote for this guy. Hmm. And then they went back to her during the next election, and she's basically, he didn't do shit for me. Nothing, nothing changed. Wow, color me surprised. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, yeah. our whole country is built upon the individual and building up the individual. And that's so you, why you I'm a Trump a big, supporter. You see a big connection between personal rights and personal responsibility. Absolutely. Individual rights, individual We're all divine beings having a human experience. And it doesn't, you can be an atheist and not believe in God or not. But at the end of the day, the first, like the second line of the Declaration of Independence says, it's assumed that all men are endowed with certain inalienable rights that are unalienable rights. That means they can't be separated from you. They yeah. come from the creator. Yeah. So it doesn't matter if you don't believe in a deity. The whole yeah. country, the whole republic, the whole constitution well, is based been, upon that premise. I've always viewed creator it could be anything that you believe created you. And that could be as simplistic as your parents. Literally. Or the creator of the simulation, if you believe what Elon simulation. Musk and his brother think that maybe even, this is all a computer even simulation. Nature. Like something created you. God, mm -hmm. nature, at minimum, your parents. Your parents met, they fucked, and they made you. At minimum. Now, who created them and on back, you know, whatever. But yeah, I've always took, I've always, I'm a secular atheist, subjectivist myself. So yeah. But what, what fascinates me, though, is that you actually, you're like me. You have a large online platform, and it's not dedicated to politics and social, you know, uh, criticizing socialism, things like that. But you take time out of your business and out of your life, and it even can cost you at times, like it has me. <clears throat> you stand up for what you believe in. Oh, it cost me a shit ton of money talking about it. I'm and sure. A lot of followers, a lot of people going, fuck you, I'm yeah, unfollowing. Yeah, yeah. It's like, I don't care. You know, everything I yeah. teach, it's like the quotes on the back of the book. Enlighten yeah. the people generally, and yeah. tyranny and oppressions of body and mind will vanish yeah. like evil spirits at the dawn of day. It's If you yeah. understand that quote, you're, then you shouldn't be surprised that I talk about politics and individualism and gun yeah. rights and you know individualism well, I say, versus i admire socialism. the balls it takes and the the <clears throat> audacity to stand up and integrate these different ideas that a lot of people would not see connections between you're drawing connections basically between self-improvement self-help relationships personal responsibility and individual rights and i firmly believe in doing that but most people don't most entrepreneurs are not going to do that that they, they i think they should uh, recently for example elliot hall says a big youtuber is you know mm -hmm. a couple million followers and he went full hardcore trump maga all that probably about I don't know, two years ago, not even. Mm -hmm. And he lost a lot of fans, pissed off a lot of people. But he's all about it. And he's like, he's kind of like, yeah, 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 fuck it. Cost me money, cost me followers, but he's doing what he believes in. Yep. And he's not that's, a dick That's about masculinity. It. That's exactly. what a man does. A man yeah. does what he must despite the consequences. And like, you're like, Elliot, I don't, that. I don't think you're a dick about these issues. You believe what you believe and you talk about it. And they can either, you know, exit the video or watch it. Mm -hmm. And you're just going to keep fucking doing it. So I, I love it, man. And so I think a lot more entrepreneurs should do that, especially ones that have a media platform. 
Like you don't obviously you don't run like a pizza shop. It's not like you're putting like mm-hmm. fucking you know twenty Trump twenty Trump signs in your pizza store, but you have an online business and a media output, a media machine you've built, and it's admiring to see that, man. Thank I you. think America would be a lot better place if more entrepreneurs did that. More yeah. of more, little by little. It's like guys yeah. like us, you know the. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, you're looking at about 60% of the population. They have a herd mentality. They're just going to do what everybody else does. Yeah. And like we were talking about before we started filming, only about 3% of the colonists were the ones that actually fought and supported That's and right. won the American Revolution. So we don't That's need right. everybody because most of the people are just going to do what everybody else and does. And a lot of anyways. people don't understand that. Like growing up, I didn't, the little bit I learned in school about the American Revolution, I didn't understand it was such a small minority, such a small percent. That actually fought and got that done. Mm-hmm. They were supported a little bit, you know, by wider culture to a degree, but then they had opposition too. They had the people who were the the remainers, I guess mm-hmm. we call them now with Brexit, the first Brexit. It's amazing um, they finally got that done, but I think it was. Uh, yeah, I know. Winston, I think it was been dicey. Winston Churchill, or maybe it was Thatcher, said that sometimes <clears throat> you have to win battles more than once. That's right. You have to win the fight more than once. So they Brexit passed. Yeah. Yeah. But then the politicians who were all leftists and communists fought it and prevented it from happening. And the you know, like even Piers Morgan, even though he was supportive yeah. of he was he was a remainer. He was like, We voted for this. We law our side lost. You yeah. need to follow the will of the people. Yeah. And I like the fact that he stood up for that because right. he's otherwise we don't have a democracy. Yeah. We're in a fucking dictatorship. I did his interview I did an interview with him obviously recently that you know, a lot of people have seen and people think I don't like Piers Morgan. Even on the on the show, his co-host Susanna was saying I don't like him, and I still like him. Uh, well, I have mixed views of him. I mean, he's on guns. He's like a communist. So I don't like that. Yeah. Some of his views I, I don't agree with, but yeah, I mean, you know, as as flippy floppy as he can be sometimes, I think he still has a pair of balls and he uses them mm-hmm. to challenge feminism, wokeness, or even common sense stuff. Like my country voted overwhelmingly, or at least majority, for leave, and they need to respect that. Yeah. Yep. And the dis- so he's, I think he has a degree of intellectual honesty that a lot of people don't see or they don't want to see. And even my interview with him when he was coming at me and stuff, I knew a lot of it was kind of like devil's advocate. He's just bullshitting or not bullshitting, but uh, playing up the drama, mm-hmm. playing like, you know, all that, that kind of angle. Yeah. Moving on. You mentioned you're a big fan of Donald Trump. You're 50 years old. So you have a much, I think, higher altitude perspective on this phenomenon. Yeah, we grew up when, like in the early 80s, there was a movie called The Day After. And there was another one that the UK made. It was about nuclear war and how that. So we we grew up, like I think in elementary school, we, you know, did drills where you have to get under your desk and kind of thing to protect yourself in case the Russians attacked us. Yeah. And, you know, the Red Menace. I mean, I grew up when Ronald Reagan was president. And. You know, we the way I looked at it and my generation looked at it, and I got a, a friend of mine that's from Berlin, right. and uh, it's like they were all glad when the wall came down and that communism collapsed because, again, that yeah. was collectivism and socialism for the world to you're see. Not a Bernie it failed bro? everywhere. You don't, you don't like communism? You're not a Bernie bread dude? Absolutely on, not. You get free shit, dude. You get free college. You get free whatever you want. Yeah, and if they don't like you, they just take you out into a field and put a 7.62 round in the back of your head dude, like the, gulag, the Chinese the gulags do. are not that bad, man. The Bernie gulags are going to be nice. Yeah, I heard one of those Bernie yeah. supporters saying that the gulags weren't that bad. It's he wasn't like, as a supporter. He worked he for He needs them. to read... What's he was his a staffer. Name? Alexander Solnichin? Yeah. Solzhenitsyn? Project Veritas. You could see that, yeah. Yeah. He wasn't as a supporter. He works for the Bernie campaign. You know, some sort of staffer organization thing. But you can tell because you wonder, it's like, how did so many people get killed in communism? It's like, all you got to do is watch those Bernie bros talk about it. And anybody that doesn't think like them, if you can't be reeducated, you should be killed. They really believe that. And anybody that's a collectivist, socialist, you know, because this, you know, the documentary that we did on socialism, it's called Mm -hmm. Socialism and Capitalism with a... You know, socialism and capitalism with a question mark. So it goes back here. to the 1800s, where it actually started in the United States, a colony called New Harmony. Wow. Okay. So it's so your YouTube channel. You actually have even, even more videos than we do. We have about 1,600 on YouTube, which is a lot. You have over 2,000 on your channel. Uh, a little over 2,300 now, I think. Yeah, at this point. That's a, that's a shit ton of videos. And a bunch of documentaries that we've done so far. Well, yeah. So most of your videos that are not documentaries. They're mostly video coaching newsletters. I think you call them, right? Yeah, video coaching newsletters. Yeah. Most of them um, answering some of these email. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'd say the majority of the stuff is dating, relationship yeah. pickup kind of questions. Guys are in situa- situations with women that they're mm-hmm. just trying to figure out. I'm able to read it and see their mindset, what they're yeah. doing right, what they're doing wrong point them back to the book or you know where their thinking is flawed tell them what to do differently and so that guy learns from it and everybody watching yeah. that learns from it and you know i've got people that have been watching me for years have learned my stuff and they started their own youtube channels and, yeah. and 
done really well. Now you told me a story the other day during the interview that you had a guy subscribe to your channel for five years, I think. And then he finally went out and bought your book. Yeah. And he told you. And you were like, what? It's pretty common. People yeah. follow follow me for years and years. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think I had somebody tell me they were following me for eight years and just wow. bought the damn book. So, wow. you know, that's, and there's other people. That's similar to me at this point. <laughs> but hey, here we are. You know, Here we are. Better late than never. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, your channel, it's interesting because yeah, you do mostly, like we do mostly speeches and then we mix in like a podcast or an interview sometimes. You're mostly these video blogs or coaching newsletters, and then you mix in these pretty elaborate documentaries. Mm -hmm. I think you have one right now on the Second Amendment on guns. It's like a three-part documentary, I think. Yep. Yeah, on. the third part comes out uh, Monday. It's called uh, mm -hmm. The Second Amendment, um, The Gun Solution, where we look at, at countries like Switzerland, mm -hmm. where they have a really great, you know, there's only the top three countries in the world that have the most firearms in the population. Number one is the United States. I think number two is Sweden, or, I mean, uh, Switzerland. And the third one is Yemen. Wow. And wow, I didn't see by that far, Switzerland is, you know, they don't have the problem with uh, mass shootings and stuff that yeah. we do here in America because they start at a young age. It's because they're, you know, they have a, they're a small population and yeah. the government's goal, because, you know, they, they dealt with invasions throughout their history. Yep. If everybody armed, everybody trained, yep. people take their guns home, they're, you know, the kids when they're young, start training with guns and people that have mental issues and criminals are not allowed to own them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's very effective. So we could look at some of the things that they're doing over there. It's mm. and part of what I'm doing with some of the, you know, the guys that I know, like John and Manny, you know, Manny of Palm Beach Tactical and mm. John of Kinetic Consulting is that I want to help get out into the culture that not only is it fun to shoot, but yeah. it's your sacred duty. It, it's the founding fathers intended that every single person, have yeah. a weapon and be armed. The militia, that's why I call it the militia. The Jefferson people. has been quoted for that too. I think that every young man should be, and I believe that too, that if you don't, if you don't have a firearm with you most of the time, if not all the time, it's irresponsible. Like you need to take responsibility for your own safety and your own life. And you do that with a firearm. Yeah. The police are 10, 15 minutes yeah. away on a good day, no matter where you are. And yep. if somebody's kicked in your door, three big guys with knives have kicked in your door yeah. and your wife is home or your girlfriend's home with your three mm -hmm. hot teenage daughters, <clears throat> And they and you've decided, well, we're anti-gun. We don't believe in it. And three, you know, big dudes with knives yeah. kicking your door. It's you know, well, the police also. The police are going to come and clean up the mess. They're not going to be. They're yeah. not going to get there in time. They have no duty. They have no duty to protect you either. According to the Supreme Court, they had a ruling back in two thousand something. And even if they even if they get the call, even if they haul ass, it doesn't matter. They have in terms of legality, they have no duty to protect you. You would think they do, but they don't. They have a duty to enforce the law. But that doesn't mean they have to like get there in the moment and protect you. That's your responsibility, yeah. Yep. Yeah, people don't even understand this. They want me to do the convention that we do, obviously, 21 convention. They want us to, want us to do it in New York and California and shit. And we've never done that. We do it in Florida and we did it in Texas once too. And in Florida, we do it in Orlando, Miami, Tampa sometimes. But I'll never do it in a state in America where I can't carry a gun. In Europe and Australia, I kind of compromise on that. It's very limited, obviously, in Europe where you can carry a gun in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. Even that can be a little bit difficult if you're not Swiss. But in America, I'm like, no, we're going to do it in Texas or we're going to do it in Florida because I want to fucking carry a gun. Yep. Because I'm personal, I'm responsible for my safety as well as the safety of everyone around me. I want to make sure that the attendees and the speakers can carry if they want lawfully. And I don't want to go to a state like California where that's basically impossible. Like, no, I'm not going to, what the fuck is the point? Yep. So I want to say a good example of where you've been picked, you know, to do the event. Yeah. A leader leads by example, not by force, as Sun Tzu said. That's right. Fuck yeah. So a rise of Donald Trump, you've had some perspective on this. I mean, you, you got to experience the Reagan years, you know, firsthand as a mm -hmm. teenager, young teenager, I'm assuming. You know, did you see this coming? Like, what is it? And for me, this is the first time in American history or my personal history that I've had a president that I'm proud of. My whole life, it's been Clinton, it's been Bush, it's been Obama. It's been nothing that I was proud of. Uh, I was deeply concerned about. It. I was a Ron Paul guy back in 2012, for example. I was not in any way supportive of Mitt Romney and... Uh, these fake Republicans yeah, he's a and shit. Flip flop and fucking beta male. Yeah, he's totally. got a rubber for spine. I saw no meaningful difference between him and Obama. And same thing yep. in two thousand eight. These are the same people. Yep, the same people, different different uh, window dressing. So what's it been like as an entrepreneur and as a man who's you know fifty years old now, seeing all this go down? Like, what has this been like for you? Well, you know, when I was it. growing up, everybody was proud of America. It was, you know, mm. Americans were the good guys. You know, we were taught yeah. Americans were the ones that helped win World War II. We were the arsenal of democracy. Uh -huh. You know, the Russians took the, I think they lost some, somewhere around 30 million people. 
in the yeah. war and you yeah. know we were supplying them with with the weapons and stuff hmm. before we had entered the war and then even after the war we all worked together to defeat nazism and so you know my both my grandfathers fought in world war ii my wow. my mom's dad he was shot in the hip he literally walked he was a i think a sergeant in the army and he walked across europe to help liberate it hmm. got shot and wounded in the hip and he always walked with a cane and hmm. it shortened his life and he died when i was six so i never really got to know him and so wow. that was World War II directly impacted me because my, my grandfather basically died and I never got to know him. Yeah. My dad's father, he was in the Navy during World War II. <clears throat> he was in six different invasions and so he you know, and he loved history and so even after the mm. war he studied it and wow. every weekend when we hung out with him he was always telling war stories mm. about his experiences and things he went through fighting the Japanese, fighting the Italians, fighting the Germans. Wow. And uh, it was fascinating. Yeah. And then, you know, what when you look at, especially if you watch any of the videos from uh, Yuri Bezminov, the uh, KGB defector who defected in the, I think it was the early 1980s. Yeah, he's he on, worked, on YouTube, yeah. Yeah, I've you can it. see all the videos of, of the interviews of him. I think it was, uh, what's his name, Griffin, Robert Griffin? Because hmm. um, we have part of that footage in our socialism documentary. And hmm. he talked about ideological subversion and I mean, when you look at like what, uh, what's his name, McCarthy did in the 40s and the 50s with going after the people in Hollywood, because Hollywood is full of communists and right. collectivists. And uh, Ayn yeah. Rand even went in front of Congress, uh, author and yep. you know, philosopher for that specific issue. She was part of a, a guild, an anti-communist guild they had in Hollywood. It was her and a couple other uh, directors and stuff that were fiercely anti-communist because they were worried that it was being infiltrated by communists. Of course, today there's no communists in Hollywood. No way, right? Yeah, they're democratic socialists now. Yeah, that's but at right. the end of the day, it's still the same ideology. Yeah. And um, the American pride issue, though, that's interesting because uh, Bernie Sanders recently, you know, running for president on a debate not too long ago, a couple weeks ago, he said just in public, you know, right on the debate stage, that America is a, I think he said, a racist society top top to bottom or something like that. Yeah, it's all identity it. politics, which, again, yeah. is all right out of the Ministry of Propaganda of, of the Communists. If yeah. you listen to Bez, Bezmenov, I mean, he talks about that. The, yeah. the idea was first to infiltrate Hollywood because they're the ones making all the movies that all, all the Americans are going to see. Yeah. And then also to get into the school system. Because when I was in school, the Communists controlled Hollywood and had a pretty good hold on the media. And then they mostly controlled you know, we're active in the universities. Because if you look at like the 60s, the countercultural movement, that was mm -hmm. all a result of communist propaganda and inf mm -hmm. infiltration. And then, you know, by the time that I think the 90s came around, they had complete control of the uh, collegiate system. They had um, mostly control of, or starting to gain almost all control of the high schools. And then since then, in the last 15, 20 years, they, now they control K through 12 and the universities, yeah. they control the media and every, you know, in Hollywood. Yeah. So every, if you, all you're going to do is turn on the news and listen, listen to these guys. You even, you listen to Bloomberg yeah. talk. He says glowing things about the Chinese and yeah. a guy like him, he perceives himself as what he calls the intelligista. Well, he even America. called Bernie Sanders a communist last night though, which I found pretty amusing. Yeah. So they're well, like eating each other is what's going on in part. Well, yeah. the way these people think these, elite like they love to refer to themselves is they look at the rest of humanity like we're too fucking stupid to know what's good yeah. for us that's why he did things with passing the law where sodas can only be a certain size I remember, yeah. because his idea is if we force you to only be able to buy smaller cokes therefore yeah. you'll, you'll drink less coca-cola and sugary drinks you'll be less obese you'll have a happier life and you know at the end of the day, I know what's best for you because I'm a billionaire and you're not. And guys like me should be making all decisions. It's kind of yeah. like the same mentality that, you know, the Rockefellers mm -hmm. had, you know, because they all inherited the money from their grandfather and great grandfather. And mm -hmm. they never had to struggle for anything. They mm -hmm. grew into a family that was basically the richest family in the world at the time. Silver and, Spoon. Yeah. Him and Brzezinski <clears throat> and all those guys, you know set about to they believe that people like them should be controlling everything and that's what led to the european union it's amazing because when you say this out loud it's like this strikes me as like highly dysfunctional aggressive narcissism exactly it's like i know it's best for you and you're gonna fucking do it because if you're born with everything if you're pampered yeah. and you know their family was fucked up anyways you know they believed 
It was only they because you know human beings have five human needs: certainty, variety, significance, love and connection, hmm. and uh, certainty. Hmm. And you know these guys, it gives them a feeling of significance because they're important. If they're changing the world to their vision, they feel like they actually matter and they're hmm. important. And all we've done is you know fuck up a lot of things in the West, and now the people are kind of we're hmm. all collectively clawing it back. Yeah. It's like what I think what really started we started to see in 2016 with Trump was that things would get reported in the media and then or actually things would get reported on Twitter and then eventually would filter down to the media. The media 9 times out of 10 would broadcast something out and say this is what happened. And a week or two later after the media has moved on, it would all the facts would come out that yeah. they were completely <clears throat> wrong. It was all bullshit. And there's no retractions. No. And so everybody heard the lie, but they didn't hear the retraction. And with Facebook and Twitter and the rest of social media and YouTube, you're actually able to see yeah. what really happened. I wrote about that, you know, all the, the shootings with the uh, Black Lives Matter movement and all these, you know, the, um, uh, what was his name? Michael Brown, the hands up, don't shoot one. It's like, it oh, yeah, didn't yeah, even yeah. happen that way. And uh, so you but say most that, of the country believes mm -hmm. that that's what happened. And it's just mm -hmm. simply not true. The Trayvon Martin thing, same thing. It's most people's perception of, you know, 99% of those events was they heard the lie and the inaccurate reporting. Yeah. They didn't hear the facts after the, there's almost afterwards. like a, like a first, uh, first sound off bias. Like whoever gets like the, the story out first, whatever way they present it is assumed to be true. And then correcting it later, it takes time and effort. It's like with Denzel Washington. There was I got a um, one of his quotes on my Instagram where mm. he was berating a reporter because he's like, I'm you know, you guys, your life. your effort to be first and everything, you end up reporting stuff that's not even true, and then you don't ever come to hey, we were wrong about this. They just kind of brush it under the rug. Maybe they put a retraction on page fifteen and some yeah. little blurb that nobody's going to see. Yep. Oh, we we made a mistake and this was wrong. I think everybody remembers Trump, the lie. Trump kept saying, "Open up the libel laws. Open up the libel laws." What he meant is, I think, is attacking uh, organizations and corporations that do this crap. Yeah, they, 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 you know, put a retraction out or not weeks later, and nobody even fucking pays attention. The damage is done. Yep. It reminds me, too, Winston Churchill's quote, if I'm quoting correctly, that uh, lies spread fast and the truth spreads, spreads slowly. It takes mm -hmm. time. But the Internet, you know, like you're saying, I think it's starting to change that. And maybe Trump is like the first time we've ever seen that at that scale. Yep. I um, mean, it's, you know, billionaire and now president, you know, gets to say whatever he wants constantly. I love it. People keep bitching about his Twitter. I'm like, you don't get it. His Twitter is the most powerful thing that he has. Well, what he understands about the media <clears throat> is that they emotionally overreact to everything. And mm -hmm. so he says things that are polarizing because at the end of the day, mm -hmm. what's that going to do? That's going to give him the mic. Yep. Drives attention. And, yeah. And if people are, you know, at the end of the day, if what you observe, you participate in. And so if he's got the mic because immediately he's constantly shoving it in his face, it's yeah. like, He's putting the message out and he's yeah. he's no longer having to go through the filter of the media. The people can actually yeah. go online and watch his rallies and listen to what he actually says. I mean, Wait. if you sit there and watch him in a, ra a rally and then as soon as he's done, all the CNN commentators come on and tell you what they just talked about. Yeah. And it's like they were watching, like Scott Adams says, it's yeah. two different movies. It's like yep. they, they say things that are the exact opposite of what he actually said it's and implied. Yeah. Because they're trying to propagandize people and get them to well, see the world their way. I think what technology has enabled him to do is with the news or whatever the fact or whatever the idea he wants to get out is, he's not just first in doing it. He beats the media. It's instant. I mean, he just goes on his phone and types something or speaks at a rally and it's like, boom, done. Mm -hmm. You can't beat that. It's literally like instantaneous. It's awesome. And I, I hate when his supporters say they want him to tone down his Twitter and all this stuff. It's like, you don't get it. You need to like you know, let him be support him in being who he's going to be which is fucking donald trump that's that's one of the best things about him being president is he's like he's the exact same guy he was five years ago he's the same fucking guy he didn't change mm -hmm. and he's fallen through i think to the best of his ability on what he promised he's doing pretty damn good yep i'm, I'm happy up. with with what he's doing he's got more done than anybody i've seen in yep. years you know you know, we're talking about other presidents it's like i love reagan growing up i mean i was a little kid <clears throat> when he was growing up and then obviously when he left office i was leaving you know i was finishing high school yeah i felt safe around him and the people that that he was involved with and i was you know originally supportive of bush senior when he got elected and then i had a bunch of my friends that i went to high school with they were all in the second marine division from the first gulf war mm. 
It was interesting when they came back, they were all like, fuck him, I'm voting for Clinton. Wow. Because they, you know, being deployed and being over there and yeah. you know, seeing what they saw, they, they wanted nothing to, to do with that. And yeah. um, Read my lips, no new taxes, man. Yeah. No new taxes. It's, you know, and then you, you recognize, like, especially now I look back at him, and then when his son, you know, George Bush W. got elected, I was excited about um, Colin Powell and all those people. I was like, this is going to be a great presidency. And after the thing with the Iraq war, because I've had a lot of friends over there. i got friends that got blown up over there. Yeah. Friends have been wounded. Clients have been wounded over there. And so I get a different perspective of what's going on. And it's like, yeah. George Bush sucked ass. He was yep. a shitty president. Yep. He was one of the worst presidents we've had in a long time. They're all part of the same you know, establishment, too. It's why it's the same shit over and over and over again. I, I am amazed that Trump was able to pull it off. Ron Paul tried doing this, and he, he was not able to do it. He didn't have the skill set, the wealth, the relationships, whatever you want to say. I think he had a lot of the ideas, but he lacked the other the other uh, factors and uh, mechanisms to pull it off, mm -hmm. to infiltrate the Republican Party and just win out, beat the competition like Trump did. And Trump was, you know, for years, Roger Stone and put, pushing him to run for a presidency, independent, reform party, whatever. But Trump was smart enough to wait, be patient, timing, and then go through the main party system and then take over the whole party. And now on top of that, the Democratic Party is collapsing all in it. It's imploding. All on its own. Now he's he's agging it along, but it's really happening. It's wonderful to see. Every day these people fight with each other, and it's just like it's just falling apart at the seams. One of the quotes I was sharing you with the other day, when, you know, mm -hmm. uh, one of my teachers, his name is Panash Desai, he's one of these kind of spirit Indian spiritual guru type guys, and he said, said a lot of enlightening things. And one of the things he said about ten years ago, maybe it was about eight years ago, he said everything that no longer serves humanity is dissolving. Mm -hmm. I'm describing like you know the the time that we're in and. If you look what's happened with the Republican Party and now what the Democrats are going yeah. through and how the, you know, the media and Hollywood and it's all, it doesn't serve humanity anymore. It's, yeah. you know, people are tuning them out. It's, I saw a, a study, I don't know, about a month or two ago about, and it's something like 73, 74% of all Americans, that's Democrats, Republicans, independent, mm. all believe that most of what's in the mainstream media is bullshit. It's yeah. wrong. It's inaccurate reporting or yep. outright propaganda. And so... The majority of the population is awake now and so when they hear something in the media whereas you know five ten years ago we just assumed it was accurate yeah. now everybody's going eh, i'm going to kind of wait and hear all the facts we before i make a decision. about it yeah exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and people go you know like i follow people all over the world that are yeah. actually good reporters and report accurate information and that's where i get my info from yeah. whatever topic you're into you can find experts in that you know somewhere in the globe and you can follow them and if you see somebody that's constantly publishing bullshit that turns out to be wrong yeah you just click unfollow and they're gone from your feed forever and you know yeah. you tune them out and that's why you're seeing like in the uk with the bbc and people are you know bitching that you know the government needs to prop that up and give them money and yeah the licensing yeah, and bullshit. yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. the same thing with you got uh, what's his name brian stetler on cnn is like you know we're important and we should be funded and people should be forced to pay for us and wow these guys suck. Yeah. They're terrible propagandists. It's like when you actually listen to these guys, yeah. they sound like shitty actors from some B or C rate movie. Wow. <laughs> I mean, they're horrible. It mm. all looks fake. They're yeah. just reading a teleprompter. There, yeah. there was a, a clip a couple of years ago that came out. And it was like a montage of this. I forget what this. It was just some story that you hear in the evening news every night. And there was about 30 different anchors from all over the country reading the same script. Yeah, I've seen it. And so yeah. when you look at the Associated Press, the Associated Free Press, it's like Local a story news gets written, worst. pumped into there, and all these news outlets all over the world that pay yeah. to be a part of that just take it, throw it in the teleprompter, yeah. and they're, they call it their, their talent, their, their newscasters just... Just read what's in front of them yeah. without any thinking. They're just with Make Women Great Again. I saw some of that too. A lot of it at the beginning was a couple of original articles, and after that, especially once it hit like Fox News in Orlando, it kind of got just regurgitated like this phone game. Everyone was just kind of saying the same shit. They were stealing each other's articles and just rebranding it, and very little new would be added to it or nothing. And occasionally you'd get something decent. There'd be an interview or you know a longer piece on it, but mostly it was just the same bullshit over and over again. And yeah, seeing that media cycle go through, yeah, it's just gross. There's no originality to it. There's no creativity. There's no independent thinking. It's just, you know, vomit whatever's on a teleprompter or whatever's on, whatever you're told to read or whatever mm -hmm. you're told to write. Yeah, we've been getting a lot of interview, or uh, not just interview requests, but a lot of media requests to attend the event too from all these fake news organizations, Vice News, BuzzFeed, all this bullshit. 
Yeah, and they're not going to write anything yeah. favorable, even no, if they enjoy it. Because, oh, yeah. you know, controversy sells. At they the end of the agenda. day, if there's an argument <clears throat> or there's, you, know, if you just look at Twitter. If there's yep. a video of kids fighting or whatever, or pe adults yep. fighting, it goes viral. People go nuts over yep. that shit, and it's all no, blood it's an, sport. It's you an know? agenda, and even if we, even if they end up liking it, like, because the event is really good. Everything that we do at the events is, like, super pro. Even if they end up liking it, their editor will still force them to write mm -hmm. a piece on it. So we've been, so far, I've been turning them down, but also now I'm like, well, what we're going to do now looks like is we might... We want to protect the privacy of the attendees, so no filming, no photography from anyone but us, because then we blur out the faces. What I'm doing now, though, is I'm offering them a fake news <clears throat> press pass, and it's, it's several thousand dollars. It's actually it's got a fake news logo on it. They have to buy it, and I sold our first one the other day to BuzzFeed. No so, shit. Yeah. Oh, it'll be interesting to see what they actually write. I already told them like we don't ex we expect you. You're getting. You're, you're, I told them they're eligible for a fake news press pass based on their treatment of you know the Trump and Mog and all this stuff. I'm like I don't expect you to write anything positive about us and I'll be surprised if you do I expect you to write a negative hit piece that's unfair and biased and I'm okay with that if you want to pay us several thousand dollars so they're kind of at first they're kind of just aghast they expected to come in for free and I'm like no why would I want you to come in for free give us money pay your pay your fake news tax so it's pretty enjoyable to do that actually because initially I was just gonna tell them to fuck off like always you mm -hmm. know I don't want you around yeah when I get media right. requests I just ignore them yeah. Cause they're, they, yeah. Cause when I've done them in the past years ago, when I first started, it's the amount everything. I could do a YouTube video and get way more book sales yep. and questions and people <clears throat> appreciating that versus, you know, having to get up at five in the morning so I can do some 6am, you know, yeah. morning news show or whatever yeah. that yeah. I'm not going to get any business out of it anyway. Yep. And then, you know, I don't have to deal with assholes, you know, being dicks yep. or whatever. I mean, I'm 50 years old. I want to enjoy my life. I want to yeah. hang out with like-minded people. And yeah. Yeah, you know, they're dinosaurs. They're dying, and all you know, like Scott Adams said, yeah, they're yeah. just gonna slowly fade away. It's I funny because on that interview with Piers Morgan, the feminist called me a dinosaur for my views or something, which I felt, that's what Piers Morgan said anyway. He said it on the on the show itself. They they called me a dinosaur. Well, I'll, I'll take that. I appreciate it. But the reality is that they're that's the opposite. You know, they're the dinosaurs. Their thing, their organizations are falling apart. The viewership, all that stuff. So yeah, it's good. Uh, let's move on a little bit here. Sure. We, uh, you commented the other day something that I'd heard from other guys your age, other speakers, psychologists and coaches and things like that from the convention, 21 convention. Mm -hmm. And basically you said that uh, it's getting harder and harder at an alarming rate, if I'm paraphrasing you correctly, for young men today to find young women who have any good degree of quality in terms of like had a good upbringing, good parents, uh, make good decisions, things like that. So that's different though than what you went through. In 1985, I think it would be a lot different, you know, dating than it is now in 2020. Yeah, we didn't have cell phones or yeah. pagers were just kind of coming out. And the cell phones were like these big giant bricks. If you ever saw the original oh, yeah. Wall Street with Charlie Sheen. Oh, yeah, I've like, seen it. I yeah. had one of those in the early 90s when I was, <laughs> when, after Hurricane Andrew hit and I was working down in the, the wow. Cutler Ridge area. I had one of those big giant phones and, you know, my phone bill would be like three or four hundred bucks a month. Wow. Yeah, back and, then, that's a lot of money, too. Yeah, because it was expensive. Yeah. It was the old analog, and you get yeah, out of range yeah. of the tower, and you're, yeah. you know, you hear the static. But talk to me about that from, like, a perspective of people. Like, what have you seen change for, like, men have changed, too, over time. You know, I think for the worst in a lot of ways. But the manosphere, I think, is doing a good job at reversing that, pushing back against that, teaching men how to be masculine again. I created Make Women Great Again in the 22 convention because I don't see that happening for women. They have kind of, like... Well, they get raised, you know, in probably not good conditions, not good uh, parenting and all that. But also in wider culture, they have nothing positive, nothing, not in mainstream, not even alternative, really. Mm -hmm. There's a few, you know, channels and books, but it's like really sparse. And I have a few of them here, like The Surrendered Wife and things like that. But talk to me about what you've seen change as, a, you know, you're 50 years old now. What have you seen change in women? Since, well, uh, really, 20. if you look back at the older movies, and I use this a lot in, in my videos and when I'm doing phone sessions with people, if you look at the old old videos going back to the 50s, 60s, okay. maybe the early 70s, the men were always masculine, very stoic. They're focused on their mission and purpose. Like, hmm. it's a wonderful life. The one with Jimmy Stewart and Don yeah, Reed. Yeah. I mean, he's like, I'm, you know, <clears throat> as soon as my brother finishes college, I'm shaking the dust off my shoes of this crappy town and I'm going to go see the world and I'm going to hmm. slay the dragons and I'm going to conquer. And yeah. Donna Reed's character is this beautiful younger woman that he grew up with in a neighborhood. I think she was, I don't know, six, eight years younger or whatever. Hmm. 
and they run into each other and she's just like george bailey's gonna be my husband someday that's and so mm. she schemes and plots with all the women in the neighborhood to arrange meetings between the two of them where wow. you know he can see her curves and her figure and her charming voice and become enchanted with her and because she wants to settle down nest and have babies and live yeah. in this old beat up house that's at the end of the road mm. And he's like, I want nothing to do with this. I'm getting out of here. And he's a real dick to her at one point in the movie. And she starts bawling. And then he grabs her, kisses her. And, you know, they live happily ever after. If you look at movies like with Cary Grant, Charade, with him and Audrey Hepburn, that was one of the best movies as far as, like, that playful sexual tension between a man and a woman where he's playfully kind of being a jerk, a little arrogant, but mm. he's not really being serious, and you can tell there's a lot of par- points when they're interacting where she looks at him and it's kind of taken aback, and she can't tell if he's fucking with her Good. or he's being <laughs> totally serious, and she loves it. And there's a there's a part in the movie where at the end, after all the bad guys have been defeated, and she's kind of you know getting the blood off, you know, sewing up his wounds and stuff, and <laughs> and she just moves in and she kisses him, mm. and he makes out for a little bit, and he pushes her away, and he goes, cut it out. And she looks at him like, what just happened? And then, you know, she's kind of sitting there and he's like, well, what are you doing? She's like, well, you told me to cut it out. He says, I'm not done complaining yet. <laughs> and then she smiles and they start making out. And that was, I think, the end of, end of the movie. Well, that, that to me, everything you just said speaks of positive gender relations. Yeah. And in my opinion, that's a way I conceptualize what's, what's been happening. And it sucks. So you don't see yeah. that anymore. What yeah, you see now is you see... And I noticed that, especially in the 80s, and especially now, it's like all you... I mean, Bill Cosby, you know, he had a great television program, and he presented a pretty good healthy archetype. Hmm. You know, even though he turned out to be a fucking sexual deviant, it was, yeah. you know, dropping drugs and girls' drinks. Which yeah. I was shocked to find that out, because you think this is... He's the man. But you acting know? is still acting. I yeah, mean, exactly. Spacey, kind of the same but that power. was a healthy archetype of a family and that yeah. playfulness. And at the end of the day, the man's going to do what he fucking wants. <laughs> and eventually, the wife will begrudgingly go along with it because he's the man. He's the head of the household, and that's yeah. what she signed up for. Gee, and, that sounds like toxic masculinity. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> that all it just changed. I mean, you saw all these. You start to see these supplicating. I think the what's his name, uh, John Cusack, say anything. The one where he's he's holding the boombox, you know, way above his head, hmm. and uh, you know, on this girl's front lawn that he's you know over pursuing, and of course, you know, that kind of shit works in the movies. But so you see this archetype that's constantly pre- presented in the media and in movies that the guy's the bumbling idiot and the woman's the stoic, strong. Hmm silent type in other words the women act like men and the men act like basically insecure little girls yeah and that's supposed to be normal and you're supposed to be extra nice to women and women don't want a pussy they already have one yeah. so yeah good yeah, that's a good way to put it yeah, yeah. <laughs> so things have continued to get that way and if you got kids that grow up in a family where mom and dad aren't around or mm. you know their last key kids as, as we were it's like you see that from the time that same theme over and over from the time you're a little boy till you grow up you think that's normal that's how a man is supposed to interact yeah. with a woman you go do that in the real world and you can be her gay male girlfriend you can be the guy that fixes her toilet and changes the tires in her car and replaces di- her battery while rates. she's fucking yeah. you know the bad boy in the motorcycle yeah and he's thinking eventually i'm gonna get my shot and yep. she always dates these jerks and you know eventually she'll see what an awesome guy i am and yep. want to marry me and we'll live happily yep. ever after and that's the narrative guys tell themselves yeah yeah it doesn't work in the real yep. world and so it's like you know yep. fast forward to today there's a lot of broken families a lot of families where right. you got single moms it's yeah. you know the good thing is i have a lot of single moms that follow me and read my book to teach their <laughs> sons how too. to how to be a man yeah um, i've had several women that are principals of schools of high schools that are yeah. teaching their sons how to date how to be men because the man's not you know the father's not around yeah and so to you know idea like when i do phone session with the guys you know the majority of them that are having problems it's because they made a bad choice but they don't know what to look for yeah and so the reality is is that women that come if you're looking for a long-term relationship whether it's a girlfriend that you live together with and have kids or maybe you're traditional and you want to get married and you know have a traditional type of marriage the best candidates for that kind of a loyal monogamous faithful family type of relationship are going to be women that grew up in that kind of environment that's right the parents are together 
the girl loves her mom loves her dad especially she says things like my dad is my rock and i have a problem i call my dad and because those kind of women they learned how to trust men they learned how to act like women they learned to be respectful they watch their parents work their differences out through communication yeah and they grew up in a culture of it basically a family culture exactly and yeah. so those girls are going to be more level-headed mm-hmm. easy going easy to get along with and it, it doesn't mean that where are these, somebody women, that, where are these women at they're hard oh, they're, 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 they're hard to they're find Poland. there's I gonna, not i was going to say poland they still have a lot of this yeah it was fascinating i spent about a month there last year on two trips and just to see even superficially as a tourist there or not a tourist but working or whatever just, just going around the city and seeing these positive experiences and relationships was fascinating. Like, I had never seen anything like it in America. It, was like, it felt like being in a movie, like an Audrey mm-hmm. Hepburn movie or some shit. It was like, like a black and white movie, like, brought to real life. Yeah, it's you like know. we were talking about the other day. They grew up with communism. They all they know oh, yeah. all about collectivism. Yeah. They all Everybody's got families and grandparents that yep. were murdered by the communists. and They have no fucking That's why they, they look at us and they're like, you guys are fucking nuts over there. Yeah. We already went through all this. But... Yep. Kind of the way I look at it is that socialism started in the United States and it needs to fucking die here. Yeah, good. All right. Fuck yeah. Yeah, I love the, uh, you, you come across in your demeanor and the persona is like, you know, you are very calm. And then you're just like, yeah, so, so, socialism needs to fucking die. Like, that's great. I it love kills it. Mil- hundreds of millions of people, man. It's, that's right. It's that's fucking right. misery. If you look at what the Chinese are going through with yeah. the coronavirus right now, yep. I've seen tons of video of people being dragged out of their houses and off the quarantine and the people are going kicking and screaming yeah. because they know typically when the police come to take you away, you're never seen or heard from again and you yeah. you can't fight back. Everybody's completely disarmed. Yeah. And that's just... Yeah, look at Hong Kong. I mean, all the protests and stuff going on, at least they were before the coronavirus. Yeah. That's great that they're doing that, but they don't have the firearms to back it up. Yep. And if push comes to shove, China can just march in there and fucking do whatever they want. Pretty much. Yeah. We'll see what happens. Uh, winding down, we got to end in a few minutes here. Let me see how much time we got left. We got a couple minutes. Uh, I want to get one more dating question and kind of st- a few steps back, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, I was going through your book today, and just some of the chapter uh, subchapters, I think, actually, were pretty fascinating. I liked them. Uh, let's see. So let's just go with this one. Uh, in your book here, you know, How to Be a 3% Man, you said, why not? You have a whole chapter on why you should not get advice from women. Why should men not get advice from women about women? Well, typically the average general. woman doesn't understand attraction and how it works and what affects them. So mm. it's, you can ask them a but certain- But they're women. I mean, they must know, right? I mean. <laughs> well, go ahead and try it. Go try the advice that your, your girlfriends or your sister gives you. And, Cause you gotta understand women are nurturing. They love you. They care about you. They want to see you do well, but they don't want to hurt your feelings. Mm-hmm. That's why a girl, you know, women break up with a guy and they go, it's not you, it's me. Well, they're, they're and the conflict, guy goes, they tend to be conflict avoidant. Oh, okay. So she's, okay, I, I'm a great guy and everything I'm doing is awesome. She's just a little messed up. Maybe if I just give her more time. And what she's yeah. really saying, she doesn't want to say, I'm dumping you because you turned me off and you lowered my attraction and I don't, I'm not turned on by you. My, yeah. my pussy's drier in a bucket of sand right now yep. and I don't want anything to do with you. She's not going to say that. Yeah. Most women are not that the harsh. They figure they'll just, or they friend zone you. I'm not ready for a relationship. And then the guy goes, oh, I'll just wait her out. And when she is ready, I'll be there and I'll get my shot. Because they don't want to hurt your feelings. Meanwhile, she's getting banged up by Chad and left and right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's part of the problem is they're, hmm. you know, us guys, we tend to be more blunt and brutally honest yeah. and say, no, dude, you're acting like pussy or that girl don't fucking like you. Yep. And, you know, you talk to, because I, I remember this, I went through this with um, when I got engaged to my wife. Because mm. after I remember went and buying the ring and sitting in my bed over that weekend, I was looking at it going, what the hell am I doing? I, she's great, but I don't feel like I want to get married. Huh. And, you know, I would, all the girls I worked with, and, you know, there was a lot of women I worked with, and they, you know, and the, they were and in the trip, office there. there. I was like, I was telling them, it's like, does something feel right? Say something inside feels like it's missing. Oh, Corey, you just have cold feet. It'll get better with time. Oh, That'll go God. away. She's really great. Don't you let her get away. Yeah. She's don't don't mess that up. When are you guys getting married? Yeah. You know that kind of thing. You know the reality is is that I wasn't feeling it, and I was I was unsure of myself, and I basically not I talked myself into it, and all the women that were around me wow. talked me into it, and. Wow. I went along with it. It's like one of my 
one of my closest friends. It was funny. We were talking about this a few years ago. And he's like, yeah, I knew it wasn't going to work out. I was like, why didn't you say something? He says, you probably yeah. wouldn't have listened to me anyways. And I was like, you, I would have probably listened to, but yeah, I probably would have done it anyways. There's some truth to that, yeah. yeah. When guys are in that, I see, you know, I'm 31 now, so a lot of guys from high school are going, they're getting roped into these relationships. Me and, my, me and my close friends can see it on Facebook. We're like, oh, that guy got engaged. Now he's going to get married, and it's going to blow up. This happens really consistently. Like, these, these marriages last these days with my... Millennials will last six months or a year or something and it fucking blows up in their face because mm -hmm. we can look at we can you know Maybe we don't talk to a guy for a couple of years, but we take one look at the photos on Facebook We see his body language you see how he's writing about her and the relationship and it's a fucking shit show They don't understand anything about it and they, they're just kind of walking into it or getting coaxed into it And it sucks and not all the chicks are crazy. It's just a lot of times. It's just a bad fit a bad match And on top of that the guy doesn't understand women uh, more generally yeah, one woman yeah. That publicly that I think is good and knows what she's talking about is Dr. Taylor Burroughs. I think you're probably oh, yeah, familiar yeah. with her. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm going to interview her soon. She's she, great. <laughs> she, knows, she knows what she's talking about. So yeah. that, like her, her yeah. she's one of the women out there. If you're yeah. a guy and you want advice, you, that's, you'd want to listen to her. She'll be she at the 22 convention on Press Pass. Oh, cool. A real, a real news Press Pass. We have the real ones for the real independent journalists, basically, or independent media creators like her. And then the fake news Press Pass is for the fake news people, mm -hmm. the BuzzFeed and the Vice News and the New York Times and shit like that. Yeah, she's great. There are a few women out there that get it. Um, not even just with dating advice, but even one of my favorites lately is Professor Janice Fiamengo, if you know her. Mm -mm. Yeah, great uh, Canadian professor. Basically, she's an advocate of men and of men's <coughs> rights uh, and culture, and she does a really good job. Super savage. Uh, holds nothing back and is absolutely in favor or supports and sees the way that men are being treated today. Divorce court, family court, and in wider culture with stuff like Me Too. But yeah, it's, you got to find the Taylor Bros and the Janice Fiamengos, and there's not that many of them. There's a few, but yeah, there's not that many. And I agree with you 100%. I was just kind of fascinated with the title of it. Don't trust, you know, don't get advice from women about women. Yeah, they don't want to hurt your feelings. They, they just hope that you'll figure it out later on. That's what, yeah, they want you to get it anyway. It's a lot more, on a one-to-one -one basis, women are a lot more aroused by that. They're counting on you to get it. They want you to get it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, it's exciting to them. They love it. And if they, if they have to tell you, it's like the uh, the observer effect. They hate it because mm -hmm. then it just it loses all the magic and the and the sparkle to it. It means you don't get it. You might get it later, but not with them in the moment. Yeah. Let's see how much time we got left. We got to wrap up. Cool. So it's been good having you on. Last question. You are fifty now. At mm -hmm. some point, uh, you were either at some point you're going to die or you're going to retire. Um, I'm never going to retire. I'm going to work till never. I drop dead. You got to okay. do something. Because, you know, I've, I've had the one thing I've always done is mm -hmm. been able to set my life up so I can have time to think. Yeah. Because I'm a thinker and a contemplator and I, I figure things out. And, um, you know, I've, I've spent plenty of time laying on the beach doing nothing mm -hmm. for days and weeks. Because, you know, I lived on South Beach for a couple of years, yeah. uh, the nicest, most luxurious place that they have down there. And it was amazing. Hmm. But, you know, you can only sway in the hammock for so long or sit on your porch and listen to the trees blowing. Yeah. As a man, you got to get out there and experience some kind of friction in the world. Yeah. And you got well, to you, you you have some kind of purpose that gets you up early and keeps you up late at night. You're 50 now. Between 50 and 70, 20 years is going to pass. So by, what do you hope to accomplish as Coach Corey Wayne over the next 20 years? Anything. Well, I want to keep obviously making the documentaries and having a positive impact, and okay. I, I would love to see this all this media edifice die. And mm. you know, I do coach a lot of people in Hollywood mm. uh, that are actors, that are directors, that people that mm. work behind the scenes. And you know, some of the movies I know that they work on, I do see some positive archetypes. Yeah, some po positive archetypes on um, that's showing up. Yeah, in the movies. And uh, so that's good. And, yeah. And, you know, because the reality is a lot of the movies, pe people just aren't going to them because they're garbage because yeah. they're presenting a falsehood. And on yeah. some level, we all know it's kind of bullshit. We don't the feminist crap's it. particularly bad. And it's like super cringe. Yeah. Yeah. It's it like does. what I talked about. Everything that no longer serves humanity is dissolving. It's, it's yeah. dysfunctional. It's not truthful. And people are rejecting it. Yeah. You know, it's like, why would you watch CNN when you can just go to YouTube and you can watch somebody <laughs> like Tim Pool? Yeah. Who's just trying to present as down the middle type here's the facts here's the reporting like yeah. the old school walter cronkite was you mean news or tim russert I, you yeah. know even to this day i don't I, know I if tim russert was liberal or he was republican or, or yeah. what he was same thing with walter cronkite i think what you're, no what, I think you were talking about is called news yeah and it used to just news. it used to just be called news yeah. and now we have to classify it because there's so much bullshit 
Well, it's been good having you on, man. I appreciate it big time. Likewise. Thanks awesome. for having me, man. Fuck yeah. Appreciate it. Hope to have you at the 21 convention someday. Our fans have been uh, bugging me about that for a while. You know, it's up to you. You let me know. Uh, door and the opportunity remains open for whenever you want to speak. I appreciate that, man. Yeah, man. Everyone else, appreciate you tuning into the interview. Please hit uh, like, subscribe, share, comment. I appreciate it. Make sure you check out his website and his channel. His website is understandingrelationships.com. You can get his book on Amazon where I got it, How to Be a 3% Man. He has more books beyond that, and they also have audible versions, too, that he narrated. Yeah, if you go to understandingrelationships.com, both my books are free. You know, Even if you think I'm full of shit and I don't know what I'm talking about, mm. if you go to understandingrelationships.com, put your name mm. and your email in the subscribe box. Mm. As soon as you hit submit, it's going to take you right to the members area where you can read it. Mm. And then once you and just apply it. And once you see that it works for you, then go buy an audiobook or a paperback. Last thing, how do they find your channel? Other than a uh, link in the description. Uh, it's on YouTube uh, forward slash Coach Corey Wayne. Okay, sounds good. Corey, cool. thank you very much. Thanks, man. Everyone else, I'll see you in the next interview. Peace.